Bernie is standing and face the front. Peace. Wait a minute. <laughs> Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ, Christ is risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. He showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also Amen. with you.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of mercy, we no longer look for Jesus among the dead, for he is alive and has become the Lord of life. Increase in our minds and hearts the risen life we share with Christ, and help us to grow as your people toward the fullness of eternal life with you. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. The first lesson is from the 10th chapter of Acts. Peter began to speak to the people. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses, and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received, in which also you stand, through which also you are being saved, if you hold firmly to the message that I proclaim to you, unless you have come to believe in vain. For I handed on to you as of the first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unfit to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we proclaim, and so you have come to believe. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite the children down for a sermon for all of God's children. A word as the kids are coming. We are a congregation that loves babies. Whether they are quiet, hello, whether they are quiet or loud. We love squirmy teenagers and wiggly toddlers and everybody in between. So parents, take a deep cleansing breath. It's okay. Grandparents, you too, deep cleansing breath. Okay. All right. Well, it is good to see everybody here. And I have to tell you, I remember on Friday when I stopped in, there was a Good Friday kids camp going on. There was lots of music and a lot of movement. And at some point, there was a lot of mess. Does this sound right for those that were there? Okay. Now, the rumor is the mess ended up on a white cloth like this. 
And some people may be thinking, uh-oh, somebody's in trouble. But the good news is, Good Friday always points us to Easter, and on Easter, our messes are made clean. Now, I would like to say that I had something to do with this. <laughs> I did not. Miss Sarah helped us clean up the mess. And she reminded me to remind you that God takes all of the things that we do well and all of the things that we kind of mess up, God takes them all and gathers them and makes them beautiful. Just like our messy white cloth became brilliant white. That is the good news of Easter. And sometimes we get lost in the middle of Easter baskets and Easter bunnies and Easter lunches. We forget that the beautiful part of Easter is that God takes all of us, brings us in God's love, and changes us into beloved children of God. That is the Easter good news for today. So whether you're feeling all pulled together or super messy, if you're feeling quiet or loud, if you're feeling calm or wiggly, whatever's going on, because of the love of God that we see in Jesus, God is making it absolutely beautiful. Let's pray about it. Faithful God, thank you for wiggly little people. Thank you for proclamation of messes made into something glorious. Help us to remember that your love, seen in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, points us to profound beauty. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next week. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first week, day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? 
When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. be seated. So our gospel lesson is a little unusual. And before we lean into it, I want to share with you a conversation between a father and a son. Now the father is Preston Fields, who is a son of the congregation, who serves as a pastor in Illinois and he and his young son Neelan who's about four years old they were talking yesterday and they said uh, Preston said tomorrow we're going to church and Neelan said why <laughs> Preston said because it's Easter and we're going to celebrate Jesus and Neelan looked at him with all kinds of amazement and said is Jesus gonna be there and Preston said, yes. So when we get ready to lean into this unusual gospel lesson, where the ending seems all kinds of wonky, I want us to begin by opening our eyes and looking around and knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is here. He is here in the word spoken through the lessons in the gospel. Jesus is here as the word is enacted through the sacraments, through Holy Communion, and at the 11 o'clock service at the baptism of sweet grace. Jesus is here because two or more are gathered. Let us pray. God of love, you have changed death into life. You have changed fear into courage. You have changed despair into hope. Change our hearts that being raised with Christ, we may live brand new lives, knowing that the pattern of an ending leading to a beginning is in fact 
a beautiful miracle of this Easter season. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So we come to the end of the gospel lesson, and I find myself going, that's the end? We have women muted by fear, and there is not a single glimpse of the resurrected Jesus confronting the doubts and calling out the faith of his followers. Really? That's the end? If I'm being honest, I will say there's a part of me that thinks it's kind of awkward. It's less than satisfying. It is most certainly anticlimactic, and it is downright distressing. Now, before we get too down in the dumps, we have a couple of options. And the first option is to consider that this is exactly where Mark intended to end the gospel. We'll come back to that in a minute. There's also the option of considering the longer ending that is also included. And I can just imagine a bunch of well-intentioned writers adding a few details here and there to wrap things up in a bit tidier manner. Now we know from the Gospel of Mark that up to this point, this particular Gospel story has been action-packed. One of Mark's favorite words is immediately. Immediately this happened, and immediately this happened, and immediately this happened. Jesus is always on the move. The gospel story moves right along and then pump the brakes. We come to this odd screeching halt. And we can admit that an alternative ending known as the longer ending would allow this account to sync up more neatly with the gospel of Matthew and Luke. So there are a couple of options here. Another thing that we can take a look at is a pattern that we see through the Gospel of Mark. And it actually leads us right up to this awkward ending. The bulk of this information comes from Dr. David Lowe's. And he suggests that the first part of the two-part pattern in Mark is that those who are closest to Jesus... And those who should tell others about him often don't. So the disciples hear Jesus predict his passion three times. Not once, not twice, but three times. Predict his passion. And they regularly end up dazed, confused, and arguing about who is the greatest among them. We have Peter who confesses Jesus is the Messiah, but completely misunderstands what that means and actually gets rebuked by Jesus. Again and again, those who should know, those who understand, they just fall short and they fail to share the good news. Now, the second part of the pattern is that those who do understand what's going on, those who do perceive Jesus rightly, they are not the most reliable witnesses. In the Gospel of Mark in particular, Jesus encounters a lot of people who um, have demons. And the various demons that Jesus casts, casts out of the people, they know exactly who Jesus is, recognize him in a heartbeat, and they grasp the import of his ministry. But how many of you all really want to count on a demon for a good testimony? And towards the end of the gospel, there's the Roman centurion, having just put Jesus to death, who acknowledges him as son of God. But let's be honest, it isn't likely that he is going to share the good news with anyone. So this two-part pattern of people who should know, not knowing, and the people who do know, not being reliable witnesses, this two-part pattern 
could actually prepare us for this wonky gospel ending. Perhaps we should have anticipated the betrayal of Judas and the denial of Peter. Perhaps we should have guessed that the disciples would desert Jesus. And finally, we should have looked forward possibly to the seeming failure of these women who up to this point had been his most faithful of disciples. The scripture says they were too afraid, too afraid to speak of the wonders they had heard. Now, I just want to have a sidebar here for a moment to allow us to put ourselves in the place of these women. Can you relate? Has there been a moment when you knew you wanted to speak or probably should have spoken and you found yourself frozen without words? But in the moments that follow, the minutes, the hours, the days, you are literally overflowing with all the right and witty and bold things to say. Maybe it's just me. But um, I believe that we probably have been in the place of these women. And I think that that makes this ending of the Gospel of Mark perhaps the most human and the most relatable to us today. And it seems that Mark just kind of wraps it up. Hard stop. And we ask, is that really the end? The Easter good news is no, it is not the end. It is just the beginning. And we actually have a clue as Mark's gospel opens with these words. The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. A beginning. Today we celebrate Jesus' triumph over death, sin, and hate. A beginning. Today we celebrate how that triumph draws us into the story. A beginning. Today we celebrate that God is not done yet. A beginning. Today we celebrate God is equipping each one of us to be in the middle of God's ongoing redemption. A beginning we celebrate God is nurturing our Easter faith even when we lose sight of the pattern that death and resurrection and death and resurrection really is a reason to be hopeful so we gather with the women and what we realize is they may have been afraid for a moment, but Mark didn't let terror lead to denial. And just because the women were afraid in the moment doesn't mean that they were always afraid. At some point, somebody said something, and that makes all the difference in the world. They were encouraged to go back to the beginning. Go back to where the story began. Go back to the basics. And there you will see Jesus. Put another way, theologian Frederick Buechner proclaims, Resurrection means the worst thing is never the last thing. Never, never, never the last thing. Amen.
rejoicing that Jesus has risen and love has triumphed over fear. Let us pray for the church, the world, and all those in need of good news, kneeling as we're able. Holy God, we pray for the body of Christ, the church, where the church is persecuted, protect it. Where the church is privileged, grant it humility. Where the church is fractured, heal it. Guide us all to embody Christ's love in the world. God of grace. Life-giving God, we pray for the earth, your good creation. Join our prayers with branches lift in praise and roaring waters of new life that together we may proclaim Easter hope. God of grace, hear our prayers. Merciful God, we pray for all peoples and nations. Free oppressed communities from occupation, exploitation, and abuse. Teach leaders your way of justice. Empower peacemakers and all who work to end violence and strife. God of grace, hear our prayers. Liberating God, we pray for people everywhere who long for good news. Roll away the stones that keep people from living with dignity and wholeness. Breathe new life and hope into people struggling to make it through each day. God of grace, Hear our prayers. Loving God, we pray for this community of faith and for your spirit in our midst. Feed us at your Easter table and fill us with your wisdom that we may serve and care for others. God of grace, hear our prayers. Eternal God, we remember those who have gone before us in death. Renew our trust in your promises that we live with joyful courage and compassion. God of grace. Into your hands, most merciful God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your abiding love through Jesus Christ, our resurrected and living Lord. Amen. It is my privilege to welcome you. You may have a seat. Um, it is good to be the people of God here in this place. A special word of thanks to all of the people who have helped make today happen, whether it's worship leaders, choir members, altar guild, all the people that helped fix breakfast and things like that. So a word of thanks and a word of thanks to you for joining us. We'd like to ask those of you who are on the center aisle to grab the pew register, make note of having worship with us, share your contact information with us, and we will share with you the things that are going on. We receive the gift of music as well as the gift of God's people with the offering.
dead. Risen one, you call us to believe and bear fruit. May the gifts that we offer here be signs of your abiding love. Form us to be your witnesses in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our true vine. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, gave Yeah. Hey.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve us in his grace. Amen. Amen. And as we go, may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.